Amen. So I'm going to have you keep your place there in 1 Samuel chapter number 16, and we're going to flip over to Galatians chapter number 5 for just a couple of minutes. So we're in the Fruits of the Spirit, continuing the Fruits of the Spirit sermon series this morning, and we're going to look at another one, um, another specific fruit of the Spirit this morning. I'm really enjoying this sermon series. This is how, remember, the fruits of the Spirit versus the works of the flesh. This is how a Christian should be known. This is how these are things we should strive for. And if you can tell you're in the Spirit, you can tell you're not in the flesh by, you know, if you're known by these things and not by the works of the flesh. So in 1 Samuel chapter number 16, we're going to get back there in a minute, but look at Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 22, if you would, just for a minute. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So we looked at several of these so far, but the one we're going to look at this morning specifically is there in verse number 23, where the Bible says meekness, temperance, Against such there is no law. We're going to look at temperance this morning, this word temperance, and look at what um, that means that we should be. Now, the definition, I really like the, you know, for, you know, I really like the definition in the dictionary of temperance here. It gives a very um, similar uh, definition to what I'm going to outline for you this morning of what temperance is. But the definition in the dictionary of temperance is this it says, control over one's acts, thoughts, or feelings, moderation, restraint. You know, some examples of temperance and the word temperance um, that you could think about just from today is like something like, like tempered steel or tempered glass, things like this. Um, tempered glass is, if you've ever, you know, like the side window of your car is tempered glass. And what that is, is basically it's glass that is made in a certain way where it's heated and it's cooled and it's heated and it's cooled to where it has a structure that is uh, it's basically a structure that's that's stronger that's harder um, that doesn't break just like have you ever had a, a a countertop like a coffee table or something with a glass top on it that's tempered glass all right but one thing about tempered glass which which is interesting is if you've ever seen a side window of a car break another thing about tempered glass is it breaks into very small pieces which makes it much safer um, you know, where, versus non-tempered glass, you know, will break into huge shards. And that's why um, those windows at the old church building, by the way, were very dangerous windows because they were not tempered glass. And if they broke, they would be these big shards of glass coming down and they could actually hurt people. So anyway, what's the point? The point is tempered glass, tempered steel is harder. It breaks, uh, it, it, it does not break easily is the key here. All right. And temperance is, you know, control. So, you know, you don't break easily. You have control. You're a stable person. And I want to give you three areas that you need to exercise temperance in your life um, this morning. But basically another word for temperance could be this, this phrase called self-control. That's basically what temperance is. The ability to control your acts, your thoughts, or your feelings. And I've got kind of those things broken into um, three categories that are a little bit different this morning, but basically it's things that we want to do in the flesh, but having temperance will mean your flesh wants to do this or act in a certain way, and you stop that. You stop your, your initial lust or that feeling that you have, and you temper it. I mean, you basically are, have control over yourself, all right? Things we want to do in the flesh that we shouldn't, and the ability to stop that. That's what temperance is. All right, so I'm going to give you three aspects of temperance this morning and look at how we can control those things. The first one is this. Go back to 1 Samuel chapter number 16, and let's get an example of the first one. But the first one is this. We need to be able to temper our mood, or what the Bible would say, our spirit. All right, so the first thing that we need to learn to temper or area that we need to have temperance in is our spirit, or what you could just say, you know, your mood, or the, the type of attitude that you have in that moment. This is the first, and look, uh, the number one spirit, you know, aspect to control, probably the most dangerous, is that spirit of anger, all right? And the Bible talks a lot about that. In Psalm chapter 37, I'll just read you a few verses. You're going to 1 Samuel chapter number, four, uh, chapter number 16. I'll read you a few verses about anger. The Bible says, cease from anger, 
and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, meaning anger will cause you to, if you don't temper your anger, it'll cause you to do bad things. It'll cause you to harm things and people. Look at verse, uh, Proverbs 14, 29 says, He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. Meaning that, you know, the Bible never teaches that you should never be angry. All right. You know, it just says it should not be something that comes quickly where you just snap and just like you go from zero to anger in, you know, a second or whatever. Proverbs 19 says, the discretion of a man deferreth his anger and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. So the Bible saying it's not that you should never get angry. As a matter of fact, it, it even talks about God being angry many places in the Bible. It says, you know, you should be slow to get angry. You should temper your anger. And if you can defer it, you should. The Bible saying if you can defer your anger, you know, pass over a transgression. I mean, the Bible teaches that in the New Testament as well. Just suffer yourself to be defrauded. Just let it go. That's the best way to handle conflict in your life. But, you know, the balance is that it's never, you know, you don't want to be someone that just never gets angry either, all right? Because there are things that should anger you. Somebody's trying to hurt someone that you love. You have to, you know, defend against something. But again, remember our methodology for the fruits of the Spirit. Are you an angry person is the question. Would people look at you and say, that guy's angry all the time, or that guy's moody all the time, or that guy has a bad spirit all the time, all right? Are you someone that's quick to anger, all right? Look down at 1 Samuel chapter number 16. And the Bible says in Psalm 103 in verse number 8, it says, The Lord is merciful and gracious and slow to anger. Thank God that the Lord is slow to anger with us. Thank God that the Lord doesn't just snap on us, his people, or we would be in a lot of trouble. And look, <clears throat> this is also why you need to handle, you know, your children when they throw temper Tantrums. Look, notice that word, temper. You know, what is a temper? Temper is something that, you know, somebody that has a temper. I remember there was a guy that I used to go to school with from grade school all the way through high school. And I've never in my life to this point seen someone that had such a horrible temper as this guy. He would just completely lose his temper. Somebody threw a snowball at his car one time when we were in high school. I mean, look, that's a normal thing, like getting a th snowball thrown at your car. If you live in North Dakota, that's going to happen to you like all the time, especially like in the high school parking lot or whatever. But somebody threw a snowball at his car as he drove by and he like went and got a screwdriver and like threw it through that person's window. I mean, it was just like he just had a temper that he just could not control. I always said to myself, I don't even know what ever happened to that guy, but I always said like he's going he's gonna to end up killing somebody one day because he had no control over his anger and his temper. But that's why, you know, look, with, with children, they need to be taught to have temperance. You know, a child that's, I mean, the, the, the child that's at the grocery store and wants a candy bar and, you know, their mom says no, and then they throw a what? They throw a temper tantrum. Those things need to be stopped in their tracks and they need to learn to be taught temperance in those situations, all right? Look down at 1 Samuel chapter number 16 and look at verse number 14. So Saul had a problem with this. Saul had a problem with temperance and it was part of the judgment upon Saul, all right? But the spirit of the Lord, look at verse 14. It says, the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. So look, by the spirit of the Lord departing from Saul, by the way, this is not saying Saul lost his salvation. This is the equivalent of, you know, not, not anymore being filled with the Holy Spirit, as that would be the equivalent of the New Testament. Since you're not, they were not indwelled with the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, that came after Christ. But, you know, the Spirit of the Lord departing from Saul, meaning he was no longer filled with the Holy Ghost, that would be like the baptism of the Holy Ghost of the New Testament, all right? So all that to say um, that he didn't lose his salvation. It's just this was something that he was in the flesh, and God was actually judging him with this evil spirit. I mean, it's not a, it wasn't a demon, okay? It was an evil spirit, meaning a troubling spirit from the Lord, okay? And the servants, Saul's servants said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. So his servants told him what was going on, and they gave him some good advice here. He said, Let our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is a cunning player on a harp, and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. 
And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. So they said, Let's find somebody that can play some pleasant music to calm you down. You're being troubled by the Lord here. You know, you're not in a good place. Let's see if we can help this situation. Then answered one of his servants and said, Behold, I've seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning and playing and a mighty valiant man, a man of war and prudent in matters and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid and sent them by David his son unto Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass, verse number 23 is the key here, it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, meaning he was troubled with this spirit, and he was in an angry mood and a bad mood, that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from here. So first of all, or from him, sorry. So first of all, this shows us a great example of, I mean, just a side note, this shows us a great example of the power of music right here. Just the power that music can have over you, both good and bad. All right? Music is an incredibly powerful tool. As a matter of fact, the reason that you will find that many, many people, I mean, I did this myself when I was a, a wrestler in high school and, and uh, junior high, like just listen to like music that would be, make you more aggressive. I was thinking back on it. I mean, thinking back on it, I should have listened to like classical music or something because it's kind of a thinking man's sport when it comes down to it. But lots of people would do this. I mean, people that, you know, are fighters and things like that, they listen to aggressive music to make them more aggressive. But here the opposite was true where David would play, you know, calming music to calm Saul down, to take this evil spirit from him that was troubling him. And look, it worked. It worked. But Music is, is many times used by Satan in this world because it can affect our spirit. It can affect our moods. And guess what? I'm going to tell a story I told to Brother Luke like last week. Brother Luke and I were working on, working on a project. And I, I mean, music is so powerful because it is such a powerful way to get messages into your head. Many times messages that you will never forget. I mean, let me just give you an example of this. Okay. So, a week and a half, two weeks ago, I'm working on this project and I'm, I'm putting a, I'm, I'm standing on scaffolding and I'm putting up, I'm putting screws into a board that is just above my reach. And I couldn't go up on the next level of scaffolding because at that point I'd been crunched into the roof. So I was standing on the lower level and I was on my tiptoes and it was, I was just running screws at this height for like half an hour. And I was just, it was getting tiring because I was standing on my tiptoes and I could barely reach where I was putting these screws in. And I had this thought in my head, and this is going to, you probably all won't know what I'm talking, I hope you don't know what I'm talking, but I had this thought in my head, I wish I was a little bit taller. And the funny thing is, you're, some of you are laughing, and I had not heard this song for over 20 years. And the song started playing in my head, and like all the lyrics were playing, I remembered all the lyrics, and there's no, I had never, it just, it wrecked my next hour. Like, and I just, I, I just laughed to Luke and I was like, I haven't heard this song for 20 years and I remember every single word like it was yesterday. That's the power of music though. I mean, that's a funny story, but that's the power of music. It's like, it goes into your head and it's just recorded there forever, I guess. You know, I guess you'll never forget um, these songs. But that gives you an idea of things that you should not consume. You know, thank God that our kids aren't consuming this trash that, you know, some of us probably did consume when we were younger. But the point is this, music has great power over your spirit, both good and bad. And look, it can, it can cause aggression, it can cause anger, depression, anxiety, stress. So if you have a problem with temperance of your spirit, you need to really ask yourself, you know, I mean, if you're somebody that's in a bad mood all the time, or you're easily put in a bad mood, where, you know, you could go from zero to a bad mood, very quickly. Look, you know, I mean, haven't you ever heard somebody call it, like, that guy's just moody? What does that mean? It means he could be happy one minute and then he's not happy the next minute. It means it's just like 
maybe one day he's happy, the next time you see him, seemingly for no reason, he's not happy or she's not happy or whatever. I mean, and then people like this seem to expect everybody else to just follow their moods. And I can't stand that, uh, quite frankly, with, with people. But look, if you're somebody like this that has, that has very little temperance in your mood, the first thing we can take from 1 Samuel chapter 16 is this. Maybe you should control your inputs. What is it that's making you moody? Are you consuming something? Are you consuming, you know, media or music or, you know, any kind of, you know, input into your mind, your eyes, your ears, whatever it is? Are you consuming something? Are you thinking on something that is, you know, look, identify that. Identify what it is that's stressing you out, making you moody, putting you in a bad mood, getting you depressed. If it's something that you're consuming, you should at least do a check and then just stop consuming those things. Because here's what you'll, here's what you'll realize. Here's what you'll realize. And look, this goes for even the internet. This goes for, you know, trash on the internet, which like lately has been, you know, a problem. And one thing that you will realize about a bad attitude, about negative people, about evil spirits, troubling spirits, they're contagious. They're contagious. And I've warned you about this guy at work. There's always this guy at work. No matter what job you have, what job you go to, there's always a guy at work that hates working there, that wants you to hate working there, that wants you, know, wants you to be upset with the boss, wants you to be upset with the company. That guy exists everywhere. And what you have to understand is you need to stay away from that person because these types, look, that evil spirit is contagious. So if you're consuming that from somebody that has, look, there's only one way. That, that type of person can be, can be described with one word, toxic. And there's only one word, only one way, sorry, to deal with toxic people, and that is to stay away from them. And that's, that goes for the internet, too. That goes for social media, especially. It's, social media is full of toxic people everywhere. And that kind of attitude will rub off on you. And if you consume too much of that, you'll just be like, you'll just be, you'll, you'll be all up in knots and, and you won't even know why. You won't even know why. So think about what you are consuming in your life. All right. The second way is this. So how do you control your spirits? First of all, check your inputs. What are you consuming? These types of things, toxic attitudes, moody spirits, depression, bad attitudes, they are contagious and they will rub off on you. The second one is this. Gain some perspective. Gain some perspective. I mean, look, things go wrong. Expect it. You know, things are going to go wrong at work for you. Things are going to go wrong even when you're doing fun things. I mean, I remember we used to have a big hunting group, and we would have a big fishing trip we'd go on every year, and we had this big hunting group that we would go out hunting several times a year with, and there was one guy in this group that, like, man, he was just, he was always angry. He was angry all the time. He was always, I mean, he was yell. I mean, if he didn't have anybody to yell at, he would yell at his dog. I mean, he was just angry, upset, yelling constantly. And I was just thinking, like, like the guy had zero temperance. Zero, at, you know, I was just thinking, what? we're out here to relax, man. It's like, we're out here to relax. You might as well be back at work. You might as well, you know, you might as well just stay home. It doesn't seem like, you know, you're having a good time here. So, I mean, what is the point of this? But put things in, in perspective. One thing going wrong should not ruin your day or your week or your trip or whatever it is. Because things are always going to go wrong. So then if you put yourself in that box, you're always going to be upset. You're always going to be upset. There's always something to be upset about. And the third thing is this. Why don't you just decide to be joyful? It's a decision. It's just a decision. Something, something's gone wrong. There's always a reason to be upset. You can just decide. Just like Luke 9.62 says, you know, put your hand to the plow you know, and don't look behind you. I mean, you can decide to be a joyful person. You can decide to not let something that happened ruin the rest of your day, your week, your year, whatever it is. You can get these negative inputs out of your life, and you can just decide to have that fruit of the Spirit that we talked about last week, which is joy. It's a decision. 
Just like you decided, you know, to come to church today. Hopefully you had that decision made long before. But the point is, it's just a decision to be joyful and to not be in a bad mood. It's a conscious effort, okay? It's a conscious effort. So step one of temperance is to temper your spirit. If you have mood problems, you need to look at where those things are coming from and get control of that. Because look, especially men, look, especially men, you should not be controlled by your emotions. Women are more emotional than men on purpose because they're supposed to be, you know, raising children and be the, you know, the understanding ones and, and all this. But men are, you know, God has put men as the leader of the household. Men should not be, look, a man, and a man controlled by his emotions, I've seen this, you know, for many, many years with friends of mine, and I, the, a man who has trouble controlling his emotions is going to have a hard time finding uh, a, a spouse. I have noticed that, like, just in practice. Men who are just easily upset, who are very moody, and I think, like, this is just a personal, like, theory of mine, that that's like a protective measure God has given women. To, to just be, like, repulsed by some, and they see some guy that's super moody, they see some guy that's just quick to anger, they see some guy that's just got a bad attitude all the time, and they're just like, ugh. They, they don't want to have anything to do with that. I think that's like a protection that God has given you know, the, like into the conscience of women. I mean, that's just been my observation. But moody friends, I've, I've had moody friends from, from the time I was in junior high all the way, you know, for, for many, many years. And they always seem to have a hard time, like, finding a decent relationship. And, of course, one that ends in, in marriage is, is the goal there, right? So men should not be ruled by their spirit. Especially, look, women should have control of their spirit as well. They should have temperance as well. But men, it is key that you are able to temper your spirit. Turn to James chapter number three. Turn to James chapter number three. Here's another area where we need to have temperance in our lives. Another area of temperance in our lives, we need to temper our spirit, number one. We need to temper our spirit, number one. Number two, we need to temper our words. James chapter number three, look at verse number six. James chapter number three, and look at verse number six. The Bible says this, it says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. That's a pretty serious verse right there, saying the damage that your tongue can do you know, to, and look, I'm kind of like separating your words from your actions. Actions is going to be number three, but really your words are your actions when it comes down to it. I mean, you're like typing words. I mean, that's a problem today. People defile themselves by just things that they say, things that they type, things that they put out there. Look, here's a shocker. I mean, turn to Proverbs chapter 29, but here's a shocker. You shouldn't say everything that you want to say. I mean, if every given moment you have a thought, you think you need to say that thought. I mean, first of all, like, that's an incredibly arrogant point of view right there. That every thought that I have, somebody, it needs to come out of my mouth, or I need to type it and send it to somebody. That's not true. Like, you should not say everything you think or everything that you want to say at any given moment. That is a horrible disease to have right there. You need to have some temperance there. Look, if you, if you say everything that you want to say or everything that you're saying or everything that you're thinking in, in, at any given time, you're probably not going to have a lot of friends. Or, or here, how about, how about this one? You're either not going to have a lot of friends or you're not going to have many people that take you seriously. If you're just this person that every thought that comes into your head, it just comes right out your mouth. Even if people put up with that, they're not going to take you seriously. Because they're just like, yeah, that guy just says stuff. That guy just says everything that crosses his mind. That guy has no filter. You should have a filter. The Bible literally teaches that. Look at Proverbs 29, verse number 11. Somebody with no filter, the Bible calls a fool. A fool uttereth all his mind. I mean, could that be any clearer? 
but a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. After what? After he's, you know, got more information, after he's heard different things, after he's learned things, whatever, you know, maybe he says it, maybe he doesn't. The point is, a fool thinks something and says it immediately. That's a very foolish person. So you should think before you speak. What should I think before I speak? How about this? Is this edifying? What I'm thinking, if, is saying this in this group right now, is this going to be helpful to people? Is this going to be something that... I mean, is there a key part of this conversation right now that me saying this is going to just really like fill in some gaps and really edify people? Look, that's possible. But many times, no. Many times, no. I mean, how about this one? Will it, will it hurt someone's feelings? I mean, the, will it be a fire? As James 3 said. You know, will it be... You know, I mean, things that people say, things that people say... And things that people type can be incredibly hurtful to people. And that's why the Bible says the tongue is a fire that set off on, on, setteth on fire the fire of hell. I mean, it's just like, can it get more serious in James chapter 3 and verse number 6? You can seriously damage people with the things that you say. Is it edifying? Will it hurt somebody's feelings? You should ask yourself those questions. Do pe I mean, are people asking me? Do people care what I have to say on, on this subject? Maybe there's a group of people talking about something that I have no idea about, where I've never been involved in that situation. I, it's, it's a technical subject maybe I've never, you know, practiced in or anything like that. It's, it's like, you know, you know, farming ryegrass or something and, and all that, and I just have to, like, I have to jump in and just say, here's how I would farm ryegrass, even though I've never done anything like that in my life. Well, you will see people that do this. You will see people that do this. Look, so what do you need to do? You need to pick, you need to have some temperance. You need to just stop, ask yourself a few mental questions before you start to blurt out something that you thought. And look, you also need to pick up on cues. If you're wondering, am I doing this? Am I saying things that I shouldn't be saying? Pick up on, on cues. I mean, look, do people leave conversations that you're in? When you start talking and you're talking to people, do more people come to the conversation or pretty soon is there no one except you? You need to pick up on these cues. Are people shocked by what you say on a regular basis? I mean, look, that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. And look, here's the bottom line with the words that we say and tempering the words that we say, and every single person in this room listening to this sermon should heed this advice. Most people should say less. Most people should say less. I mean, look, once you start saying less, you're going to realize the power of saying less. I mean, saying less, I mean, saying less, I mean, just it, it'll make you seem smarter. I mean, the Bible says that too. You know, if you just say everything, if you want to be the first one to answer every question, you're just going to make a fool of yourself. If you say less, there's just nothing but benefit for you. And you know what? You'll learn a lot more. You'll learn a lot more that way. So look, you want to be the type of person, the goal here, somebody that tempers the words that they say, the goal is that you become someone that when you do speak, when you do have things to say, people want to listen to you. When, when they hear you speaking in a room, they want to stop what they're saying and they want to listen to you. That's, that's the goal. That's somebody that tempers their words. That's somebody that won't say every single thing that comes to their mind. They'll only say things that they believe are valuable to the group or valuable to the conversation at hand. They'll make sure they don't say things that offend people, that will hurt someone's feelings. They say edifying things. And if you're somebody that has a filter where all you say, think about this for a second. We could never achieve this. But if you're a person that you only say edifying things, whenever you speak, people will just be quiet and they'll just listen to everything you have to say. Why? Because it's edifying. Because you're just like learning stuff and you're just like, they're making people feel good and they're just, you know, it's, it's, that should be a goal. And how do you do that? You temper your words. You temper your words. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. So we need to temper our feelings. We need to temper our spirit, number one. Number two, we need to temper the things that we say, the things that we write. 
We need to control ourselves. We need to have self-control in those areas. And the third one is this. We need to temper our body. We need to temper our actions in our life. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, Paul says this in verse number 27. He says, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached unto others, I myself should be a castaway. This is one where like the new version says like, I beat myself or whatever the, the goofy way it puts it where he's like, you know, and this is why you'll see people like, you know, that whip themselves over, you know, Easter and, you know, all that stuff on Good Friday. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 27, Paul is simply saying that I'm going to control myself. I'm going to control my actions lest I become a castaway. He's not saying lest I become unsaved. He's saying lest I become what? A hypocrite. He's saying, lest I become somebody that preach to others, that stands up and writes these letters and preaches the Bible to you, and then myself, I just have no self-control, and I do whatever I want to do. You know, and nobody would listen to me. Nobody would listen to me, especially, he says it's especially important for somebody that's preaching to others. Look, everybody's a hypocrite to some degree. Everybody's a hypocrite to some degree. That's why the Bible puts the qualifications of a pastor saying, look, these, these bars have to be met right here. But everybody is a hypocrite to some degree. But temperance in the area of your actions is this. Everything that you feel like doing, you should not just do, is what the Bible is teaching here, what Paul is teaching. All right, look, it's, it's kind of like last, last week when we talked about the difference between pleasure and joy. I mean, somebody that has no self-control in their actions is somebody that is just, what are they doing? They're just out there and they're seeking the pleasures of sin. They have no control over themselves. They're just into sin, fornication, you know, whatever they want to do on, look, whatever they want to do on social media, they just do. They just go out there and they just, you know, they just get into actions where they're just involved in strifes and debates and, and all this stuff. It's like, get some temperance in your life. You shouldn't be involved in any of this strife on the internet. It's not, no one has ever had their mind changed by any kind of comment on the internet. You're like any kind of zinger or any kind of comeback or whatever you, know, you think that you have that is clever to say. No one has ever had anything come of that except more strife. More people need more temperance. So look, go to 2 Peter chapter number 1. So we need to temper our spirit. We need to temper our words. We need to temper our actions in our life. We need to control ourselves. Now, if we can do that, 2 Peter chapter number 1, tells us where temperance leads. Look at 2 Peter chapter number 1, and look at verse number 2. 2 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 2. This is why temperance is important right here in this passage, and I'm going to read you. Look at verse number 2 of 2 Peter chapter number 1. So why do I need to temper my spirit, my mood? Why do I need to temper my words, have a filter between my brain and my mouth? Why do I need to temper my actions? Why can't I just go and do whatever I want to do? Look at verse number two. It says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to, unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory and and virtue. Remember that word virtue. And look at verse number four. Whereby we are given, un whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises, that by these ye might par be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Look at that last phrase right there. The corruption that is in the world through lust. You know what that means? What does the world do? What does the world do? It does whatever it wants. That's what the Bible is saying. It's like, that's corrupt. That's not godly temperance. It's saying the world goes out and they want it. The world wants something, they take it. The world, you know, wants to do something, they do it. The world wants to say something, they say it. The world, this is the world, not Christians, by the way. The world wants to type something, they type it. The world wants to think something, they think it. They just do whatever it is that the flesh wants to do. That's what the world does. Look at verse number six. But that's the world, not us. And beside this, giving all diligence. Now we see this chain, and that's what I want you to see 
the importance of temperance this morning. It says, this giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they, and it doesn't end there. They, they, it's not charity is not the end. Brotherly kindness is not the end. That ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, temperance is a vital link in that chain. That chain of what? What did we see there? We see diligence. What is diligence? Diligence is persistence over time. You are never going to be successful in the Christian life if you do not have diligence. The opposite of diligence is instability. The opposite of diligence is, I don't know, what should I do? Should I be, should I be active in the Christian life today or not? Should I you know, come to church this Sunday or not? Should I, you know, everything's a decision. You're just completely in, instable. And you're instable. If you're unstable, you'll be unstable everywhere in your life and you will succeed nowhere. So diligence is you're persistent. You have stability and you keep that stability not for one week, not for one year, but over years. If you've ever heard a pastor say the Christian life should be measured in decades, not years, that's what it's talking about, the diligence. So we're looking at this chain here, all right, this chain. And the chain ends in brotherly love and fruitfulness. Godliness, brotherly love, fruitfulness. That's where we end. But in order to get there, we need to have these things in this chain. What's the next one? Virtue. What is virtue? Virtue is high moral standards. So, you know, Christians, shocker, should have high moral standards. You know, don't take for granted that just because someone's saved, they have high moral standards. Look, Christians should have high, more, higher moral standards than they do today. I'll tell you right, right now. The virtue amongst Christians today is embarrassing. It's embarrassing. But it's part of that chain. Diligence, virtue. Knowledge. What? Temperance. You have to be diligent in this Christian life. You have to have high standards in this Christian life. And then you have to have temper knowledge. You have to know the Word of God. And then you have to have temperance, which is what? The ability, the ability to control yourself to those standards. Couldn't I be somebody that has high moral standards up here? Couldn't I, be, couldn't I be somebody? You ever, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we've met many of these people and we probably all fall into this category in one way or another where you know that you should, I mean, you should have these standards, yet you can't get your words to match your standards. You can't get your actions to match your standards. You can't get your thoughts. You can't get your spirit. You're like, you listen to a spirit, you listen to a... a a fruit of the Spirit sermon on joy last week, and then you go to work all week, and you're just you're a pain, and you're moody, and you're you have a bad attitude the whole week. Look, you have no temperance. You're not able to take your virtue that you have, that you hold in your heart, that you know is true, and put it into action. You see how temperance is a key to this chain. Temperance is the ability to control your mind, your body, and your spirit to the virtues that you hold true. That's what temperance is. Then you get what? Then you get, if you can keep everything in that chain together, you get godliness. You get godliness, and guess what? That turns into brotherly love, brotherly kindness. And then that turns into fruits. So you're like, I'm not seeing a lot of brotherly love today. Well, the chain's broken somewhere. There's something in that chain that's missing. And eventually, like, there's going to be no fruit there in that person's life either. Somebody that, you know, you got a Christian that's got, that, what do they have? They only have strife. They only have hatred towards their brother. It's like, what are you doing? Do you have control over your spirit? Do you have control over your words? Do you have control over, you know, you're in the flesh? Things that you're doing? Probably not. But they said this, and I have to say something back. What in the world? 
Live by the sword, die by the sword. I mean, where are these principles in the Bible? I guess we're these Christians where like if it's not directly spelled out in the Bible, like we don't we don't we can't like apply concepts in the Bible anymore. I guess that's where we're headed. In in 2024 Christian America today. It's just a complete lack of temperance amongst Christians today, and it's an embarrassment to the cause of Christ. I mean, can you imagine? People look at Christians today, and they're like, these are terrible people. Like, who would ever want to be like this? We're supposed to persuade men. We're supposed to have a good report. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. That's us. We're the ones that know the terror of the Lord. We persuade men. Hey, join us. Become a Christian. Become a fundamentalist, and you can join our life of strife and horror. Come on in. People need some more temperance today. People need to control themselves today. Let that not be said about us. Temperance is a fruit of the Spirit. It should be something that we are known for. We should be known for being that person at work that has the positive attitude. Even when something bad happens. Even when, you know, maybe a decision is made that maybe it's the wrong decision. But we should still be that one that has that positive attitude. We're working for Jesus Christ. We're not working for anybody else. We should temper our spirit. We should be able to have a positive attitude and a positive spirit. We should watch the words that we say. People should know you're a Christian by what you say and by what you don't say. This world talks very different than the Christian should talk. And if you're leaving that one on the table and you go to church on Wednesday night and you go to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night and then you go to work and you sound like everybody else, you're leaving a powerful tool on the table. Say, how do I do that? You know how you do that? You temper your words. But I've been, I've been cursing just like everybody else on the job site for 20 years. You know what you do? You install a filter between your brain in your mouth, and you temper the words that you say. And guess what? You'll get better at it. And people will know that there's something different with you. And some of those people will ask you. They'll ask you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Why? Because you sound different. Because the things that you don't say distinguish you from the things that everybody else says. It's a powerful tool. And then you know what? Temper our actions. You should be a Christian that has self-control. What good is virtue if you can't control yourself? What good is having these high standards? And guess what? Parents, you will pay the price for this. If you impose standards and you say, this is what we believe, and then you have no temperance over your actions or over the actions of your family, you will be labeled a hypocrite. Early on in your parenting career, what does it take to, do, to make your virtues match your actions? It takes temperance. It takes control. You have to do this. Look, this is what temperance is about. Temperance is, is about having the things that you do say and feel match what the Bible says your standards should be. And that's why it's in this chain. That's why it's in this chain. And look, ultimately, what comes at the end of this chain is fruit, is souls, is somebody that's in the Christian life for decades, not years. And more fruit and more fruit and more fruit. Temper yourself. It's an important part of the fruits of the Spirit. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.